Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Journalism Learning Labs. Uh, in case you're wondering, I'm not Irene. Um, this is Irene over here. She'll be presenting this evening. I'm uh, uh, the current president of the club here, and I just want to give a, a little introduction. Um, this is one of the the first of these journalism learning labs we've started at the the club. The gentleman sitting in the middle there, um, Daniel Hurst, is one of the instigators of it as a member. And the idea, of course, is to try and uh, give back to uh, journalists working in different fields, perhaps at the start or early beginnings of their career, and to um, show uh, and um, ways things are being done to give advice and tips. So today we have um, Irene, who is going to be running through um, digital uh, media and uploading to websites and a lot of visual work and so on, which she's very experienced in. Um, just a couple of other things. I started off in, in journalism when it was all, you know, well, what I was involved in was just printing stuff on dead trees. And that was the extent of it, because I was a print journalist. And then the photography, of course, was a very different specialized journalist. Then you had the audio and uh, video and sound people who are a very specialized team. So when we were going out to, to do stories, you had those three clearly defined roles and three clearly defined specialists. But as time has passed, as I'm sure many of you are aware, they've tended to merge into one. And in fact, I do recall myself going for an interview and being told I needed to take a video camera with me. And whilst I was doing the interview, I had to video it. And while well, I was taping it anyway, but I had to video it at the same time as I was doing the interview, which I thought, well, how do you do that, really? Because, you know, questions come up that you, 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 things come up you want to follow through with in the conversation, you lose track, and then this camera isn't, you know, it's run out of tape or whatever. It was those days. Um, so uh, we've seen that sort of shrink, as it were, into like, uh, a, a journalist being capable in all those formats, which I think is an uh, extremely uh, valuable set of skills to have, of course, and particularly now in, in terms of updating to various websites. One of the ones that's most impressed me in this field, uh, which you may have seen, was um, the New York Times sent off a couple of reporters and they went to Manila, I think it was last year, and they had the video reporters, uh, print reporters, and they went and visited all the sites where there'd been latest shootings, killings of supposed drug dealers by the Duterte you know, police, if you like, although they deny it, of course. But when they put it out on the website, it was amazingly interactive, where you could click on a part of Manila, and it would pop up and give you details of the shooting that was there and who was involved, and you could see the video. And it was just an incredible piece of work for how you can tell stories now using all of these, these different tools. It really, you know, interactive has become a cliche, but it really was, um, it, it really took you into the, the events of that evening. And as these reporters visited these different sites where people had been murdered and um, built the story was, was really quite amazing. Anyway, that's enough from me. Um, Irene is gonna run us through this and we'll then have a Q&A at the end of that. Thank you.
So good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'm a lot more used to talking to 18 to 22 year olds at Temple University, so it's kind of exciting and also challenging to talk in front of adults that um, are colleagues and peers and so on. Um, I wanted to start a little bit by just giving a quick background um, because I think if you understand my generation, you'll understand a lot where I fell into and how I, I became a visual journalist and what I had to deal with in terms of learning skills and so on. So I'm originally from Venezuela um, and then grew up in Miami and I've been in Japan for about 18 years now. Um, and I initially went to journalism school because that was, was as close as it got to film school actually, but I knew always knew I wanted to do audiovisual. And then later my master's was in, um, in film here in Japan. So in many ways, um, I began also with print. So it was a generation that obviously was very, you know, we read newspapers in school, very different to my students who hardly have touched a newspaper. Um, and little by little, it was, it, was, it was quite difficult actually to find a, to call myself something for a very long time, just because I, I liked journalism, but I didn't quite feel a journalist. Um, because you know I hadn't published enough, and then um, I had you know the, photo the photographic skills, um, learning. I, I was also the, the generation where we actually did film. So when I went to film school, we were shooting 60 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and uh, had to transition into video. And that was very reluctant because I didn't like video at the time. And then finally, in about 2009 and 2008, 2009, when the term multimedia which was interesting because that same term had been used um, uh, you know, a few years earlier when we had the, you know, the Britannica encyclopedias on CDs when they started to come out. That was also being called multimedia. So it was the first time when, when you know, the, the term came about and I understood that, okay, what does multimedia mean? And then there were all these other terms like convergence media. And basically it meant that we journalists, and that's when we started hearing the term one man band or one man, one woman bands. And it was the idea that indeed we had to print, diagram, do HTML, learn how to do interactive, shoot video, um, do photography, be able to write our text, and it, you know it was a lot of things that we were being asked to do. So um, the, um, today I'm going to talk about the meaningful meaningful journalism in the digital digital age, but also with a lot of focus on social media sites using new technologies. And the reason um, social media is because when I first moved to Japan. Um, I had a really hard time in getting stories published. Um, it was it was it was difficult. I didn't know enough editors. Um, I didn't have contacts with them, and it was hard to approach the major media, major established media. Um, so I noticed that there was a, a bit of a niche in um, actually um, pitching a lot more to emerging media. And what I mean by emerging media, you know, I'm talking about AJ Plus and BuzzFeed and um, different digital media, even BBC, you know, and all these di different digital media that had um, their different niches and you could actually, editors were, were looking for a lot of content. And I noticed that they were a lot more open to, to, to allowing us to publish. And partially it wasn't because, oh, you're a great journalist, <laughs> even though you needed to have the skills, but it was a lot because they just needed content. They really needed to put stuff on their site and that created a, a, a state of openness um, for people to pitch different stories. So um, that's on, the, on, on behalf of the, the, the publishers. Then of course there's self-publishing and I find self-publishing incredibly difficult because um, self-publishing entails um, just different skills. We hear the term these days, influencers, and we sort of wonder how these people get all their followers. You know, they don't necessarily have to publish even good content. A lot of people have gotten followers out of doing comedy or out of doing playing video games. <laughs> you know, our top YouTuber is, um, is actually a gamer. Uh, so it's very curious, and also being in contact, at, at, I think some of you might know, but I, t I also teach um, journalism and uh, specifically visual journalism and documentary filmmaking at Temple University Japan. I noticed that I was coming into contact with a generation that really wasn't consuming media in the way that I had, wasn't consuming media in the way that I had grown up in. They were all into, you know, they were following, they were not even following um, 
proper um, established media. You know, they when I when, when the first day of class when I asked, so what do you guys read? They didn't say BBC and New York Times. They were like so and so on YouTube, you know, commentator on YouTube that would comment on media, or this podcast or that podcast. But they really weren't uh, consuming traditional media and traditional established media, which was a bit worrisome also. <laughs> um, so the self-publishing aspect, um, it's really difficult to crack because there's a, there's many different reasons why somebody would potentially follow you as a you know as a subscriber on your YouTube channel or follow you on Periscope or follow you on Twitter or on Facebook Live on Instagram Stories and so on and so on. There's of course the influencers, and then of course any sort of um, shakers and movers from a particular society. So for example, in the, I, I I don't follow that many people on social media. A lot of the content I still consume is very much from the established. Um, you know, p properly uh, verified media, but the people I do follow in self that self publish are, for example, in my case, I'm Venezuelan, and we obviously have grappled with basically media, uh, you know, extinguishing uh, being being extinguished in Venezuela. Um, first, because there was no newspaper to print newspapers, that's, there was no paper to print newspapers, and secondly, just because. Um, the, the war of misinformation of Venezuela got so bad, it just became incredibly difficult to actually um, know who to follow and so on. And a lot of people just fled the country. A lot of editors from established media, you know, we had Global Vision and so on, that was like the CNN of Venezuela. They had to leave the country sooner or later because, you know, their, their offices would be broken into and so on. So it, it, um, I came to a point where I realized I had to, you know, if I wanted to get news from Venezuela, for example, I had to start seeing who, the, who those movers and shakers were in the society and where could I get reliable media, um, that, because it obviously wasn't going to get it from the established media, even though, of course, established media does cover Venezuela, but it's it not with the, with the um, perhaps frequency that I want to know about Venezuela. Um, so we have all these different platforms, you know, of course, YouTube, then we have Periscope merged with Twitter, we have these days Facebook Lives, um, and then and then Facebook Lives also, um, curious enough, because it, it also involved not, o not only all the other skills I mentioned as a, as a journalist, but then also for you to like run camera simultaneously and potentially narrate as if you were doing live coverage, um, but it wasn't just a three minute live, you know, a live could go on for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and so on, and sometimes we were even asked um, by different digital media like AJ Plus to do this. Right. So and then Instagram stories, Facebook stories, and then these days Facebook watch, um, which is, of course, quite popular. So, you know, we all know that YouTube killed, I don't know, the video star, the radio star, whatever, you know, whichever era you want to um, signify. But of course, YouTube has definitely uh, created there, there is a in the history of media, there is a before and after YouTube, obviously, um, because it addresses um, Obviously, the the, um, the the change of internet, uh, you know, going from web 2.0 to 3.0, user generated generated content, and the fact that basically everybody has access to this. I mean, we've I don't think we've ever been in an era where where we've had there's been as much democratization of media and um, as much um, uh, citizens being able to produce their own media as we are right now. Um, of course. Um, in 2011, five years after, just to bring an example close to home, uh, five years after um, YouTube began, in 2011, the Tohoku earthquake and the tsunami videos were the most watched user-generated content of that year and of the history of YouTube, along, of course, with the Arab Spring, where we saw Egyptian bloggers and vi blogger, video bloggers as well upload um, a great amount of media for us to learn what was happening on the ground. Today, YouTube subscribers are about um, 1.3 billion, and it's crazy the amount of content 300 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. There is no human being on earth that could consume as much media as is uploaded on YouTube, which makes it incredibly difficult for us to filter, curate, understand you know, what, should we be, what should we be watching and how do we get access to the information. And again, when I see it in my students, they're so niched in the way they consume media that it's... Um, I don't know if it's scary, but it, fri it frightens me a little bit. So I say, mm, wh I wonder why they're consuming that particular uh, YouTube guy, or why they're watching the news that he's commenting on from this particular person. And then, of course, five billion videos are watched on YouTube every single day. So it is something that is ubiquitous and um, and plays an important role. Now, in 2006, um, Time did a cover, and they said, you know, they called YouTube Person of the Year. Basically, it was, and it said, yeah, Person of the Year, and they had the... Um, the screen and it was you, yes you, you control the information age and welcome to your world. And it was kind of an interesting age um, because 
they they made us uh, i believe this all the participatory media that all of a sudden we had access to really made us feel like we were not only consumers of media but of course producers of media and producers of media in the way that we wanted to that we could simply cover something go out there and do anything and just upload it um to to the internet now would anybody ever watch that that was that's the next question um but that's the way that at least we understood it at the time um, so this is the article where they mentioned that um, the number of videos of the 20 most watched news videos on YouTube in the week following the 96, the, the Japanese uh, earthquake were 96 uh, million views just from the user generated uh, videos that um, were produced in the seven days following the disaster. So from March 11th to March um, 18. So of course, the prevalence of cell phone cameras created a huge shift towards user-generated content. Now, cell phone cam uh, video on cell phone cameras began emerging around 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, at the time, not every single phone had um, uh, a video camera in Japan. Uh, some of the Japanese phones were the first, you know, the little, what is it, the, the ones that you call the open and close. Those were some of the ones to have video first. Um, but of course, we had not yet connected that to YouTube. So we were perhaps, even if we were using this to, um, um, to, to, to document, we, were, we didn't yet have the ability to actually put it out there on the web so quickly. So for example, we have the Saffron Revolution and we still see some of the earlier examples of citizen journalism on video. And um, a lot of them were first shot with just small handy cam video cameras. And that eventually, of course, became uh, cell phones that people would immediately upload to YouTube. Um, so the... Um, so yeah, so this information is from the Pew, um, the Pew Center, um, and Verge also covered it, and they were talking, and, and they they address how important that 2011 shift was. Now, I uh, to understand a little bit also how I got involved in. Um, creating content for social media and viral content and so on. It wasn't deliberate. Um, I was approached by AJ Plus at the, um, while living here and they said, hey, you know, we need a correspondent in Japan and this is what we're gonna do. And when they said, you have to make a video in one minute, I went, what, <laughs> like, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, because my background had not been in news and television, so I wasn't used to, and I didn't really like 10 second sound bites, you know, it wasn't my thing. I, I much preferred uh, long form. But I said, okay, fine, you know, let's take on the challenge um, and let's try to produce a, a, a video in one minute and let's just see what happens. It, be it became, a, it really became a, um, a, a strong exercise in storytelling because, you know, how do you even choose what you're going to put, in, in, where it's going to end up in the video. So interestingly enough, we had a great editor at the time. She was covering Asia. And she approached me one day and she said, hey, you know, I want to do something about how kids in Japan clean schools. And I was like, okay, what's well, been done by the BBC and how they do bento boxes and so on. what are we going to say that's new? And she's like, no, you know, this is for a new platform. I think it would be really interesting. She's half Japanese, so she had been to Japan and understood it was a topic. I didn't see the value in the story. And to be honest, um, it was interesting because after we published this story, which uh, garnered 54 million views, um, and it garnered 30 in the first week we published, which was at the time quite a lot for Facebook, and especially for AJ+. Um, I, I, I didn't quite understand the success of the video. Um, and you know, all of a sudden people were calling and, and asking me, oh, well, you wanna make viral videos? I said, I don't make viral videos. You know, <laughs> I just made one video that went viral coincidentally and I wasn't even the one that had the final idea of doing it. So I'm just gonna show you the video. It's very, very short. Um, and then we can talk a little bit about why you actually think this could have been, um, uh, had it become viral or went viral.
ていうのにするためなのでしばらくはこのまま続いていくのではないかと思いますいろんな場で食事をしたり、物を片付けたりっていうことが大人になるとありますよね。それを子供の時からあの少しずつ少しずつ身につける。褒めてもらってありがとうとか言ってくれて嬉しい。ありがとうございました。Okay, so um. So to be honest, when when we first did this video, I, you know, I I didn't think much of it. I thought, okay, it's it's actually kind of corny, and I didn't really think much of it. But um, one thing that it taught me um, was that the reason I I believe I still believe the reason it had so many views was because it created engagement, and I noticed that people weren't watching it and saying, oh, what an amazing video, because you know it's a, it's a very normal video. I mean, it makes the cut. It's fine. You can you can put it on Facebook. You know, not a problem. It's not you know. Amazing, but、um, it created engagement. It all of a sudden people were like, "Oh wait, American kids don't clean schools." And when we looked at, when we started looking at the threads on Facebook, everyone was just referring to like, "Well, in my country, we do it like this." Why, you know, look at Japan; it's so amazing, so on. And and, and again, I'm I'm sure many of you that live in Japan are very familiar with this story. So for again, for me, it, it didn't seem even like a big deal, but it, it it created a lot of engagement, and that's when I realized that a lot of the people that are consuming media on Social media—they're not looking for an amazing story or a Pulitzer-winning story. I mean, they might be, but a lot of them are. And this is when I learned the term media snacking <laughs> because they're just kind of going, you know, sometimes、uh, aimlessly through either Facebook and just kind of scrolling down and so on. Another thing that it taught me was, and and this kind of horrified me when the editors first, because I was part of the beginning of AJ Plus. Is when they said, "Oh well, you know, it's a one minute, it's a one minute, one minute and a half video." And on top of that, we're going to put these big letters on the screen. And I was like, "What? Like, what are you going to do?" And when I saw the the the,、um, the art direction of the letters, you know, I wasn't really convinced. I didn't really like it, and it ended up being a very important,、um, also turning point for social media, especially for Facebook videos, because this is what later a lot of other media started replicating in terms of putting,、uh, you know, titles on everything, because people could just kind of scroll through their Facebook. Then we had the autoplay off on Facebook, which also was another turning point, which meant you could just scroll down your phone and look at your Facebook, and all these videos would autoplay. And even if you weren't connected and didn't have sound, you'd still have all the writing and so on. So you could consume、um, the video, you know, and that would be a, a view. And they were so short. I mean, who doesn't have a minute and a minute and a half to spare, right? So that's a, I learned quite a few lessons.、Um, With this particular video, now I, I I'm I, I'm not I'm hesitating whether to because、um, it's kind of long also,、um, but the、um, this was another another、um, experience that also taught me a lot, and、uh, partially because I it, it it also taught me that there are different editors and of digital media that are actually interested in you going more in depth in a, with a particular character with a particular story, and they're okay. You know, this was an editor.、Um, I did this together with、um, Justin, and he was the reporter on it. I was the the video journalist on it, and.、Um, He,、um, the the editor, you know, he didn't give me a time. He didn't say you have to make a video in one minute. You have to make a video with three minutes because this is what we grapple with in visual journalism, or we have to publish, you know, one picture. He didn't give me any limitations. He just said, do your story and you know, do you do whatever you want, right? So that freedom was quite amazing, and it ended up being a longer documentary. Basically, I interviewed、um, a few men that had been kamikaze or had been destined to be kamikaze pilots, and for whatever reason. Um, crazy enough, their airplanes fell while they were like on a mission because it was towards the end of the war and the airplanes were no longer like good. One of them, you know, landed in a near an island and he swam to the island and then kind of stayed there for a month until they rescued him. You know, these very interesting stories. They were both quite old,、um, but. Um, it was great to finally. It was the moment where I said, "Okay, well, I can converge a deeper story that's almost like a short documentary on a digital media platform that is actually like a proper 
outlet. Um, so that was um, also just a really good opportunity and a moment that also made me realize that. Um, so if we have time, I'll play it at the end. It's a bit, um, it's, it has a different mood than the first one. <laughs> so, um, so of course, everybody asks us, okay, how to create good content. Um, we have this exercise I do in class for my students where I say, okay, you guys have to try to um, create a video where you, that you think is gonna go viral, like a video with the intention that you want everybody to see it. And I see that it's incredibly difficult um, for people to actually come up with, if you, you, know, if you Google up what's a, what's a successful YouTuber, like how did, you know, they have all these little tips, like you have to publish a, a certain amount of times a week and you have to publish on certain days and you have to do this and you have to do that and so on. But the truth, the truth is that nobody has really cracked that question entirely. Um, I, I, in my opinion, these are some of the things that could could potentially make a, a viral video um, or a video be popular on social media. Um, of course, I, I do believe strongly that topics that create engagement are all, are a very good way to go because they create conversation. And a lot of people go to social media because they want to have conversation, they want to have interaction. Um, content that is smart, deep, and relevant. Um, what we you know, really reliable content and what we these days there's a term <laughs> just as there's like slow food. It's a slow news. Um, which is, I guess, the opposite of media snacking. Um, also to have hosts that are relatable. I, I feel that also hosts that are relatable goes a really long way on social media. Um, of course, to establish an audience. And sometimes, you know, for example, it's, I, I always put examples of PewDiePie. Have you, I mean, do you, are you guys familiar with PewDiePie? Or, because I do feel this is like also another generation. I basically learned from also my students. Um, but he has 92.8 million subscribers and he's a gamer. And basically we just, I mean, well, in my opinion, we just sit there and watch him game. Um, of course, my students see more content there. But, you know, for me, it's not that interesting. So it's quite, it's it, the fact that he's so popular really still boggles me. Um, some will say, okay, grab attention in the first 10 seconds. This is what most of the editors will tell you. This is why they told us AJ Plus, you know, you've got to have like an amazing beginning, the first 10 seconds and so on. And then of course, also add a call to action. So um, I'll talk about this a little bit when, just uh, in a few slides when we talk about the Coney 2012 video that you might remember that went super popular, but it wasn't really factually all correct and um, it had a lot of backlash, but it was a video that was seen very much, especially by you know 15 to 22 year olds, for example. And then of course, to use influencers, so as people build their audience, and this is one thing that also um, was hard to, when I first began at AJ Plus and I had to send them like my, my onboarding sheet, I had to list all my social media and then like how many followers I had, <laughs> you know? So it was a time when I'm sure, I mean, some of you when, you, when you began doing prints, you know, your editors were like, well, how good can you write? You know, this is what I wanna know. How good can you tell a story? They weren't like, hey, how many followers do you have and how much do you engage in social media? So that was also a, a moment where, a eureka moment where I realized, okay, well, it's not just about being a good journalist, but also I have to have this sort of social media presence somehow. Um, but yeah, and I, and, I, and I really don't have as much as I probably should or could. Um, then of course, there's the idea of the, there's the the idea, sorry, of uh, monetization and the different policies. Um, and this has obviously motivated a lot of people to become YouTubers, um, not only because they want to get their content out there or because they want to express themselves, but you know, you're you're meeting actual people who. Um, you were, I guess you, you still remember the era when you would ask somebody, well, what are you? And they're like, I'm a blogger. When we went to that transition to saying, I'm a blogger. And you were like, oh wait, what is, like, that's a profession? Oh, that means you're an actual blogger. And I feel bloggers have gone a really long way um, because we've seen experience like um, global, uh, wait, it's not global lives. Uh, remind me, uh, global citizens, no. The media, there was, there was one particular outlet that um, was created by a former CNN journalist. And um, that particular outlet, it's called Global, and I'm forgetting the second word right now, um, was basically, she would just curate information that was coming from different bloggers from all over the world. And a lot of these, a lot of the stories there were from journalists in countries where there wasn't full freedom of the press, or where they just didn't have access to established media because there wasn't freedom of the press, you know? So, um, 
it was it, it became interesting the bloggers really fought their way to actually become uh, and be recognized among the journalism community as like hey you know we should pay attention to the bloggers we and when we think about the Arab Spring and so on and all the information they provided while all these things were happening on the ground you know the fact that Libya was covered by people that were engineers you know Syria has been covered by citizen journalists on the ground um, people that had other lives before the war began um, we start to realize that um, uh, you know, that the, 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 the things have changed that we're able to, I mean, the fact that we had a video and this still also amazes me, the fact that we actually have historically a video that is shot with a cell phone of a Gaddafi being killed is is crazy. Like right there, right there, this is it, this is what's happening. And you know, we didn't have to depend anymore on um, a proper crew with a video camera. This is just somebody actually maybe even participating in the event of killing him while you know they're taping off their phone, while they're recording off their phone. Um, so in many ways, there's different reasons why people actually publish on social media. Of course, it could be because of the money and they dream of being a YouTuber. I have students that will say, oh, no, I want to be a YouTuber. You know, this is like their goal uh, and this is like a profession. Um, and then, of course, there's just people that need to get information out there because they are living in repressed um, regimes. So... Um, these are just questions that I consistently ask myself when, um, because even the title of the of the talk today, you know, meaningful journalism, and I thought, well, you know, can we call this media? Like, would you call this video of the kids um, um, cleaning up the school meaningful journalism? And to be honest, I I don't I don't consider it meaningful journalism. I would consider the last kamikaze a lot closer to meaningful journalism. Um, but it's something to think about how much of the media that we snack on or how much of the media that we consume is always meaningful when we're talking about videos. Of course, when we're talking about prints, I do feel in the print world and in the digital print world, we still have, fortunately, very good in-depth reportage of proper writers that you know really go to uh, long lengths to tell us a story. Um, so you know, do our videos make a difference also? Something... Um, and there's sort of a category also for that. You know, people are talking a lot about um, uh, impact producing. So when do you produce a documentary or a video where you're actually trying to create an impact? So that could be um, perhaps you're creating a video that is um, coupled with a campaign where you're trying to advocate for something. Um, clicktivism versus true call to action. So this term, clicktivism, um, I'm sure you've heard it before, but it's the idea that, and this happens a lot with Coney 2012, it's the idea that, oh, well, I share it and I'm doing something for the world, you know? So by creating that awareness, I just have to like retweet it and here we go, this is what I do to contribute with this cause, you know? But of course, that's very far from actually any sort of action. Um, and then how do we navigate and so like what to watch, you know? Do we follow curators? Do we just have inbox deliveries of certain media that we like that already have kind of like, this, you know, this is the news you need to know for today? Do you have a summary? And so on and so on. And I understand that in many ways, um, you know, tell, I, I feel like when I, when I, it's interesting because my attitude, and, I, and there's a term for this, kind of like the leaning in, they call it the leaning in and leaning out, you know, leaning in to your computer. What I feel like when I consume media on my computer, I'm more deliberate about what I want to read that day or about what I'm looking for versus like when I just like sit on my couch watching TV and I let CNN or BBC decide what are the stories of the day and you know everything's being called by them. Um, it's, it's very different attitudes towards the consumption of news. So um, it brings also, you know, who do we follow? It's always safe to, uh, I mean, I feel like it's, always, personally, I, I feel safer following a lot of journalists as well, like fellow journalists, and also think tank, uh, maybe investigators or people that are just relevant in their field. Um, but that's de definitely not what the ne next generation feels, and I, and I see that in, in, in my students especially. Um, how important does curation belong? And we'll talk a little bit about, I'm not going to go deep into fake news because that's just a whole uh, another lecture in itself, but you know, when, how, how important does curation become when we need a little bit of guidance to, you know, somebody to kind of bring to our attention, oh, you should be watching this because this made an impact or this was, uh, you know, a, a turning moment in digital media or this is like very well done and so on. Um, then of course, social media verification. So we have, um, and there's plenty of examples of, you know, people that have imitated Roy accounts and people have retweeted things from the Reuters account without noticing like the little blue check or whatever and um, not entirely have realized that it was a hacker so um, then uh, so media literacy basically um, and of course uh, investigation and I'll, I'll if we have time I'll also give an example of that um, you know how important could, could uh, video forensics and investigation also 
um, be when 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 we're trying to create a uh, good strong content. Um, and then there's the idea that every time we watch media, of course, we're trying to learn something we didn't know, unless we're just kind of aimlessly watching media. And that brings me to the next point, which is you know how many how many hours I don't know how many of you now have your in your applications like the terrifying app that tells you how much time you've spent on your phone and it kind of divides it by percentage. You know the iPhone 10 and they're like you've been watching this for this amount of day. And I'm like socializing and it you know and they have all these categories. And I look at it and I go, okay, well, this is like a good reminder. At least somebody's keeping tabs for me about how much time I'm spending on my phone and what I'm consuming. Uh, and this is just quick numbers. Uh, Facebook is still, uh, surprisingly enough, and, and Facebook is interesting because it has reinvented itself um, throughout the years to try to keep themselves being relevant. Um, I felt like there was a moment where it was like, okay, Facebook, this is it. We're at the end of the, we're at the end of the deal here. And then, you know, last year and the year before, since the 2016 elections, with you know all the misinformation and the fake news and so on, and their response to to, to all this, um, I think people have a love hate relationship with Facebook. People, they, they, you know, I see people writing, oh, like, no, today I'm really shutting down my account, and then they'll come back like months later or whatever. But it's you know, it's a, it's it's a very um, it's a very love hate relationship. Like we can't live with that we can't live without it um, but it's still the top social media I mean that is where it all is right and then of course we have YouTube and then we have WhatsApp and WhatsApp is interesting because despite the fact that it's not necessarily um, uh, you know you're not following anyone personally I wouldn't probably know half or 80% of the stuff that happens in Venezuela if I didn't have WhatsApp now it's also very difficult because the amount of information that is being circulated on WhatsApp and I don't I can never tell what's real and what's not real becomes incredibly challenging but WhatsApp groups in countries where there is a media blackout is like it, it is the platform. This is how people circulate. This is how people organize. This is how they take care of each other during protests. This is how they report things. It's just really hard to filter and to fact check. Um, then, of course, we have WeChat, which is huge in China, obviously. And then we have QQ, QZone. A lot of these are just native um, Chinese platforms. Then we have Reddit, which it takes a certain also personality to like Reddit. Um, and then we have Twitter obviously as well and LinkedIn and so on and so on. Just, just, just a general breakdown of what are those platforms that are still very relevant today. Um, and of course, Instagram, which is after WeChat. Now, when we talk about making a difference, um, I try to think, and the call to action, which is one of the points in which we, when we think about uh, social media and, and what we're consuming, um, I, w one of a case study was basically a case study because it was the ALS bucket challenge, um, and the fact that you know during the first few first month basically uh, the, you know it, was, it just garnered an incredibly amount of people watching the videos and just an incredibly amount of people that went out and did their own videos of the bucket challenge, um, and it raised tremendous amount of money for the investigation of ALS. Um, and one of the most popular ones was Bill Gates. Um, who did his own? Um, you, do you, you remember this campaign, right? <laughs> like, I don't know how many of you actually thought about ever doing it, um, but it was this little one. Can you, sorry, I need to lose this, but I'm not so quite sure. Obviously, not everybody had lecture doing it like this. <laughs> I'm here to join the people bringing attention to Lou Gehrig's disease by taking the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. I'm going to challenge three more people Elon Musk, Ryan Seacrest, <laughs> and Chris Anderson of TED. Consider yourself challenged. You have 24 hours. Good luck. Um, so it was a campaign, again, it was a case study, and just because of the amount of people that actually did their own, um, did their own video, um, but it's so interesting, you watch that he had like a multi-camera setup and stuff, most people, you know, obviously did something a lot more humble. <laughs> um, 
And it was also the time when um, it's another another interesting moment just to kind of put it in here as well was um, you might remember also when Obama uh, for the first time started uh, did a YouTube show like when the White House decided, okay, well, we're going to have three YouTubers come here and ask Obama questions relevant to their generation. Um, So that was another interesting moment when we started to see, obviously, I mean, I know we're used to like Trump and the Twitter age and so on and so on. But, you know, during Obama era i definitely feel that obama had the had he he his team him and his team and michelle they had a very strong presence social they had a very strong social media presence and they also it also made them very relatable people just kind of got to know them letter better because they had for example you, you might remember that little video with the older woman that was you know 100 and something from the south um and then that one with the like the little girl and you know so they would meet these these people that had interesting very interesting stories and create videos out of them and Obama was out there meeting with YouTubers and having like a proper show where they would answer questions, obviously related to different policies and so on. So it was definitely a time when it's definitely, you know, that moment um, definitely made it so that celebrities and, and citizens just felt a lot closer without having to have a television. Um, so this was the outcome. Uh, Bill Gates, obviously, an amazing amount of views <laughs> for his, for his um, ice bucket challenge. But these are some of the celebrities that did it and uh, some of the um, millions of views they garnered. Then we come upon, Coney, you know, we have Coney 2012. Have many of you been familiar with this campaign? Did you watch it? Do you remember this? I'll just play like a little bit. Um, it was... So here, the very beginning, he become you know he's a bit more personal with his story and so on. Um, so you know, it, it's it, the very beginning is actually not that interesting <laughs> to be honest because he just talks a little bit more about himself and how he got involved in this. But basically, the whole idea of the video was to. Um, call the world and say, hey, we have to capture Coney. Um, and it went incredibly viral at the time. The problem was that major media backlashed. Um, it, had a ma- it had a major backlash um, in, in media, in established media, because a lot of journalists did call him out for, not, for him not getting some of the facts straight. Um, so then they had to publish kind of a second video and then kind of straight, you know, straighten out some of the things that they had said in the first video. But the, it, was, it was amazing how quickly I remember walking into a classroom and all my students were talking about about that that day they were like oh did everybody watch Coney 2012 and I was like oh what is this um so if you have time it's, it's a 30 minute video but if you have time later look it up um um though it's, it is kind of long um 
Can I ask, what is yes. exactly is it about? Or what, what happens next? In, in the, um, with the video? Yeah. yeah, so he called to capture Coney. Um, Who's Coney? What's Coney? So Coney, uh, the, the, the lord, the warlord. <laughs> so here, I'll give you the, right around here. Oh. Jacob is our friend. Yeah. How many nights have you stayed here? You have to know The night I first met Jacob, he told me what he and other children in northern Uganda were living through. We were in the us again. Then they would kick us. My brother tried to escape. So he had testimonies from all the kids that had been war soldiers under Kony. So he had gone to Uganda, interviewed some of them, and then he had said, you know, he had, he had, he said, okay, well, you know, this is what's happening with these kids, and so on and so on. The, sorry. The problem is that he didn't have the whole Uganda and Kony story correct. So a lot of, you know, that had a backlash in the, in the media, yeah. But um, it was a campaign. He basically wanted people and celebrities to uh, watch the video and to retweet it and to share it um, so the United States could invest more uh, funds into capturing Kony. Um, so, sorry, I'm pressing the down button, but um, it's not going to the next slide. Mm, oh, here we go, sorry. Okay. Um, so, this is another a tendency that we also see in a lot of social media, which is like these little explainers. Um, like, I'll explain to you the crisis of the world in a minute, you know, or in two minutes. Um, so I'll play this one because it's very short, but this one also pretended to explain to us like the whole Arab Spring in two minutes. And this is a genre, and it's, it later becomes a genre in itself. If you're familiar with Vox, um, you'll know that their explainers are some of the most popular um, that are watched on Facebook. The Arab Spring is a revolutionary wave of demonstrations and protests occurring in the Middle East and in North Africa since 2010. The economic crisis led the population of several countries to defy their authoritarian governments. It all started in Tunisia at the end of 2010, when Mohammed Bouazizi, desperate with the lack of perspectives in his country, set himself on fire. His action caused commotion and protests throughout his country, culminating in 2011 with the resignation of President Ben Ali, who had been in power for 23 years. Later on, influenced by the rebel in Tunisia, the Libyans stood up against the rule of Muammar Gaddafi. Gaddafi has some disagreements with Western leaders, who embraced the opportunity to intervene militarily in his country, helping rebels to overthrow the former ruler. This intervention caused such disorder that Libya remains unstable to this day. In Egypt, the population revolted against the dictator Hosni Mubarak in the beginning of 2011. Mubarak promised not to run for re-elections. Mohamed Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood was then elected, but a great part of the Egyptian people did not accept his legitimacy, which ended up creating a new wave of protests. In 2013, Morsi was also empowered by the military, and, similarly to Libya, the situation is yet to be defined. In Yemen, protests led to the resignation of Ali Abdullah Saleh, who had been in charge for more than three decades. It is in Syria, however, that the bloodiest conflict of the Arab Spring is happening, with a civil war between Assad's government, whose family has been in power for 46 years, and the rebels, opposed by very diverse groups with often conflicting interests. Fearing that an intervention could cause more stability, like it had in Libya, part of the international community is against military solutions for the situation in Syria. This paralyzes the United Nations Security Council, allowing Syrians to freely fight among themselves. It is believed that more than 130,000 people have already died in this conflict. There are also protests in Bahrain, in Algeria, in Morocco, in Jordan, and in Oman, without regime change in any of these cases. This was our brief review of the Arab Spring. If you enjoyed this video and enjoy international relations in general, please click the like button below and subscribe to Global Guides channel to watch our next videos. See you! So, um...
it was it was interesting because a lot of again talking about the generational difference these were the kind of things that my students were watching they were not necessarily watching in-depth reportage they were not necessarily watching the news they were like oh, i want to understand the crisis of this part of the world without having to read i don't know 30 articles from the new york times and just like this two minute explaining that's going to break it down for me um and of course the problem is that it has a very cliched narrative i mean i'm not saying some of the stuff is not correct that they're saying but you know how much can you really learn in two minutes of somebody just repeating uh, sort of that cliched narrative um so this is how you know they are currently a lot of them getting the information information as well so um which and that brings me to another point which i'll talk about a little bit later which is the fact that a lot of young people are not willing to sign up for paywalls and that's why they're not interested that's why they don't read fully the new york times or the japan times or any other media uh, fortunately the guardian you know still publishing without paywalls but paywalls is also hindering a little bit a new generation that's not willing to pay for content um so we have these two little videos and these are you know if you look at these like lists some by like the thrill list and so on um they t you know they're considered to be most popular facebook videos of all time um one of them is cutting hair with swords i don't I, you know i don't expect everybody to have seen that but it's a it's a barber who cuts someone's hair with a sword um and it garnered 250 million views on facebook it was like the award the, the most viewed video of the year um and then kids growing up with dogs from the dodo and the dodo has been quite amazing as well because the dodo was a social media a platform that began with a bunch of cute animal videos which as you know are very popular on social media and all of a sudden now like the dodo produces for, an for animal planet so the fact that you know it's a little bit like vice the fact that these experiments start uh, very youtube oriented and you know with small budgets and whatever and then they grow into like proper full-fledged media you know buzzfeed and now they have a proper investigative unit so um, that you know, some digital media do manage to uh, upgrade. Um, AJ Plus, you know, of course they have their sister network, which is Al they're under the Al Jazeera group. There are some of those videos also in different, in slightly different form, also do get broadcasted on on um, Al Jazeera. So yeah, so there's uh, some some more examples. Um, and then when we, but interestingly enough, when we look at the top publishers on Facebook, um, there are a group of publishers that just dedicate themselves to actually uh, making just viral videos. Like this is what they do. They're not considered news um, uh, uh, publishers. They're, they, if you look at their description, they call themselves social media publishers and that's it. You know, they're not looking, they're just looking for things that will garner views. Um, so I, 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 to be honest, I don't consume any of these, but um, the one that I do have is tasty because my mom shares it with me all the time by BuzzFeed, which is of course the recipes, um, which brings us to all these little genres that tend to have a lot of popularity on social media. So animals and cute animals or pets, um, foods, and then obviously makeup, which is huge as well, uh, tutorials and so on, and then gaming. Um, and then the other interesting one is that in number eight is the NTD, which is founded um, uh, by the Falun Gong, and they also have a huge following on Facebook. Um, and these are some of the top of the top news channels on Facebook, and you might not even recognize some of these because we you, you don't consume them. Of course, they're from different uh, countries as well. But the only one that might really be familiar to us would be Okay Inside Edition number two, and then Fox News number nine. Um, now, just to talk a little bit uh, about some of the some of the media has actually made a difference in social media, um, and it's interesting because I feel like a lot of many mainstream media um uh, you know decided at some point to have a sister network that was digital that was for another generation so al jazeera was one of the first ones and this was before cnn created big story um and of course before um even though parallel to that a lot of uh, let's say nbc news bbc they were obviously creating digital content but they were not uh, it was sort of like a byproduct of what they already had in terms of concept. So they would just re-edit, recut, and put it out there, as opposed to like we're going to produce originally for and with the mentality that this is only for social media. So AJ Al Jazeera was one of the first ones that tapped into that social media, um, uh, digital media, and uh, you know uh, social media platforms, and they said, okay, this is what we're going to make original content for them. And then, of course, they became pretty big. And then they have now English, Arabic, French, and Spanish versions um, of what they do. Um, and then, for example, in 2016, they had generated over 2.2 billion Facebook views. Then, of course, you have Big Story, which you might be more familiar with. And Big Story really it was quite amazing because they sort of upped the, the standard for a lot of um, viral videos. These are videos that are 
much better shots. There's stories that are a bit longer, more like two to three minutes. And um, in general, um, very unique stories. They really go out of their way to make sure their stories are not so cliche and, and really have a strong character and so on. So they've been considered um, to just be a really big success for CNN, the fact that they have this sister network just for millennials. Then we have, and just, just because I also obviously follow a lot of the Spanish speaking networks, that we have Playgrounds and Cultura Colectiva, which have had a really strong impact also in South America in terms of um, the news and the videos that they produce, um, which is interesting because South America doesn't really have a pan regional news channel. What we have is CNN in Espanol, which is based out of Atlanta, and then they, of course, have some. Different offices throughout South America, but it's still CNN, and that's about it. We have then NTN 24, which is um, under a Colombian broadcaster, and then we have um, yeah, and then we have wait, we have one more that's regional. And I'm forgetting the name at the moment, but um, so the the um, the Spanish speaking world is also quite hungry, and of course, being uh, South America is important because in terms of viewership. You know, when do you have a whole continent sharing a same language, and you know, and such a big continent sharing the same language? So the amount of Spanish speakers is 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 considerable. So they also normally make these um, lists of the main media. Then we have, of course, Vox, and again, Vox became very popular because of their explainers. And they were particular popular. They were particularly popular leading up to the 2016 elections, where they were sort of break things down for us. Of course, led by Ezra Klein, which a lot of people follow as a strong thinker. Um, and then, uh, just to, no, I don't want to gloss over this, but citizen journalism is obviously incredibly important um, when we talk about user-generated media and social media. And we have to look at particular cases, uh, and, um, and I won't extend myself so much here because I really do want to leave time for comments and questions, but you know, Syria, obviously, um, had it not been for citizen journalists, we would not know a lot of things. Um, police brutality in the United States, um, you know, thanks to the fact that somebody in that point had a video camera. Um, we, we were learning, you know, how, you know, we, we saw clear examples of police brutality, some of them as crazy as the fact that, you know, there were Facebook lives, for example. Um, of course, Japan, 3-11 tsunami, you, you might remember two or three or four days after the, um, the tsunami, uh, you know, all the videos started emerging when people kind of settled and started uploading. It was very crazy to see everything that had happened and of course Iran and Myanmar and Venezuela is some cases where citizen journalism has obviously made a very big difference um, and then just really quickly of course BBC Al Jazeera CNN NBC the Russia Today with RT who has now Rupley which is uh, you know a news agency but very much concentrates on um, distributing through social media they obviously all have their all these major channels have digital strands and they obviously understand that they have to publish digital as well um, I'm going to skip a little bit over the investigative, but I am happy to share some of these examples so you can later have a full look at the, um, at the videos. Um, and in terms of technology used for content creation, so um, there, was, there was a very important moment uh, when uh, we began to use a camera, and everybody calls it like the 5D generation, and it was exactly that generation, which is the 5D generation, <laughs> um, which is I... I studied film. I didn't like the look of the flatness of video broadcasting cameras because they really didn't give you know any depth of fields, and it was just I didn't like the look at all. And then you know the five Ds, which were SLR cameras that that had the capacity to do video. We started having access to these at a relatively a relatively decent price, and of course there were different models. You, know, you could get the cheapest one; it went four hundred dollars, and the more expensive ones for three thousand, four thousand dollars. But they had an amazing look because you could have that sort of photographic depth of field look that made you feel like you were not just watching a flat, you know, uh, television image. Um, so that technology is what a lot of my generation of visual journalists used. Um, like it was me and the camera, me the camera, a, ca a microphone on top, a little lav mic with a recorder, and basically this is how it cover stories. And it was incredibly challenging because you had to do, you had to have all these skills and make sure that while you were talking to the person, you know, your sound was still rolling and your focus was still in place. Um, so it really made us 
Uh, but it was like mandatory, you know, it wasn't even a choice. It was like, okay, we well, want to be a visual journalist. You need to be able to do all this by yourself. Um, and it, television had not been like that. In television, you would have always had a camera operator, a reporter, uh, you know, somebody booming the mic. Um, so it became, it became, you know, one crew, one person crew, lucky if you had two, if you had a budget for two, um, with prices that were, you know, most stories were under $1,000 for a story. Um, and uh, and just a lot of demand. Every all the digital media wanted. They just want videos, 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 videos. It doesn't mean they don't go through a careful um, editorial content, uh, editorial selection, because the editors do. You know, you do have to pitch the editors. They do work with you with the story. But let's just say that um, maybe the bar is slightly lower than because they're so interested in producing the content than if you were obviously, you know, doing a big story for an est for established media. Um, then of course the 360 cameras, but the 360s kind of like had a little, you know, it kind of blew up and then it went down and it blew up. So it's a little bit, you know, I'm not 100% convinced that everybody's doing watching 360 videos, um, VR. And again, go back, go, uh, the cameras that were used, I mentioned, of course, the, oh, I actually left it out, the 5D Mark 1, 2, 3, and 4, the A7S 2s which are the small Sonys, often being used for a lot of the content um, uh, shot that is later published online. And then, of course, if you want to go a little bit higher, we were using Canon 100s and Canon 300s. But Canon 100s and Canon 300s obviously started to involve like a two-people crew. Um, and then, of course, your phone. However, a lot of the digital... Um, and that's probably what would differentiate us as visual journalists than, let's say, citizen journalists, the fact that we're actually shooting with better cameras than just our iPhone. Um, so, but they, they, a lot of these publishers would ask us to have these requirements and to use this equipment. Um, but they would allow, for example, they would say, okay, we want you to like Facebook Live today from you know this protest or that protest. And it was fine to use your phone, obviously, to Facebook Live. Um, and to be honest, a lot of the information, for example, it's, that's reported on the ground in Venezuela are just Facebook Lives of people. Um, so you might also remember there's it's, that's another case study which is the wall. Do you remember the Wall Street protests where people started? You know, so that was another turning point. That was the moment where me, m mainstream media wasn't convinced that they should cover these crazy people showing up near Wall Street protesting. Um, but a lot of the digital journalists went out and were like live streaming on actually livestream.com. Um, they, they weren't live streaming on Facebook yet. Facebook and Instagram and all these did not have the feature yet. So they were streaming on livestream.com and it was, it was like the first time where you had a guy with his iPhone and you didn't have a satellite truck, you know, or nobody had, you know, people had to, the journalists had to go back and file stories. And here you have these digital journalists on the ground, like, hey, I'm here, I'm in the middle of the protest, this is what's going on, where I'm on the streets. And people were following them, they really wanted to understand. And of course, there's Ferguson, you know, had it not been for the amount of people that were vocal on social media. Um, I'm sure mainstream media would have covered it at some point, but they really made, they, they really put a lot of attention on the topic and almost obligated um, mainstream media to come and say, hey, we have to cover this properly. Um, in terms of editing, we use iMovie, we use Premiere, um, Adobe Premiere Clip on your phone or Filmora Go. Um, I'm, very, I'm still a little bit old school in the sense that I cannot yet edit something fully on my phone. I, my eye, just my eyesight, like I just can't. And my finger, not good enough. So I'm still a very much a premier. I was, I was Final Cuts, and then of course when they when they stopped updating and then started using Premiere, I'm still not very convinced about iMovie because it's a little bit um, too um, maybe uh, consumer oriented and less. I would Premiere is more prosumer, um, and professionals actually do still use it. And then of course I'm a big fan of A7S IIs and of the Mark D just because they're smaller cameras and they're better to operate when you're by yourself. Um, so one thing that we're, we're slowly coming upon now is that um, in many ways, social media has its waves, you know, they become more popular, less popular in different times. But right now we are definitely grappling with the idea of misinformation on social media with, you know, market power, with the amount of information they have about us, which is why some people are obviously pulling out um, for the spread of false information. And in many ways, they're going to have to rebuild a reputation for people to, con to continue trusting them and using them. Um, how are we doing on time? Sorry, I can't see my clock here, but. Oh, okay. So let's um, we'll wrap up soon so we can have a we can have a talk. Thank you. Um, 
And this was a very interesting study that was published last year by Oxford and Reuters in 2018. And they gave some predictions of what's going to happen with digital media. So they talked about the fact that subscriptions and memberships is still a key priority for a lot of the news media. You know, you want to bring, you want to have your subscription, you want to have your base audience. Um, that... Um, uh, slowly, some of the quality new the quality news um, need bigger budgets to be produced, and a lot of NGOs and foundations are offering these budgets. And we'll talk a little bit about how Facebook and Google have pledged money for journalism. Um, the fact that the news industry, um, especially after, you know between 2016 and still now, um, because of the misinformation related to you know U.S. elections and other elections as well. <laughs> um, the news industry is actually also losing its patience with Facebook, but Facebook has been very smart. Every time Facebook launches a new feature, they will fund. So they will say to AJ Plus, hey, you know, I will give you this amount of money so you can produce content for the next six months. And that's how they're able to also have good content on their platform or content that, you know, is is going to be consumed um, because they have these 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 arrangements. YouTube did, did the exact same thing. When Vice Japan began, YouTube said, I'm going to give you this budget and you have to produce, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours of content a month. And this is how they're able to integrate. You know, YouTube knows that for YouTube to be successful as a platform, they need viewers, but they know that a platform itself is not successful unless you have good content. So, you know, they have a lot of these partnerships with um, with uh, companies and, and, and media companies that produce content that is attractive. Um, also in this, uh, in this um, survey, half of the respondents say that, 43% uh, said that Facebook is likely to be important or extremely important this year, which I thought was pretty interesting because I'm actually lost a lot of interest in Facebook. Um, but they still say that it is relevant, even though they are uh, you know, upset about the fact that, you know, with all that happens with uh, misinformation on Facebook. Um, over three quarters think it's important to invest more in artificial intelligence. And basically this means algorithms, you know, is the future of journalism algorithm, meaning am I just going to be fed what Facebook thinks I should be fed? <laughs> and, you know, is, is my whole YouTube stream going to be based on recommendations that um, Facebook, you know, thinks that I would be interested in? So um, a lot of the, the algorithms, um, that's, it's a bit of a different conversation because it, it's, sort of, it's sort of like an editor almost, but it's an AI editor. Um, so, of course, I still want to have a human being with discernment, um, but this is what, where things are moving a lot into the algorithm artificial intelligence world um, then there's of course the growing acceptance that some types of quality news will need to be subsidized um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute um, and of course platforms everybody realizes that yes platforms definitely have to set up their battle against misinformation and disinformation to be honest I'm not from the camp that blames Facebook for what happened in the US elections I think people need to have media literacy skills and be able to understand well where their media comes from and not just say oh you know this was put on my Facebook feed and I read it and I really thought like Hillary Clinton was running a pizza parlor with kids and porn, whatever, you know, so uh, pizza gates, you know, so people need to have media literacy skills. And I strongly believe in that. So um, but it is something that is being discussed strongly. Um, again, we talked about I mentioned very quickly slow news and, you know, versus media snacking. The rise of paywalls is definitely an issue that is shutting off people from quality news because a lot of people just don't want to pay. And they, you know, younger generations just don't have the money. They don't feel that content they feel content should be free which is another conversation as well but yes um then focus on developing ro loyalty and retention is quite important just because there's so much offering out there um optimizing for google has also been another back to the future trend for 2008 because they have a lot of publishers have noticed that a lot of their traffic comes from new searches in general um, then, of course, that technology can help journalists uncover truth. There was an example of a documentary from the BBC I of a killing woman in Cameron in which they did, you know, Google. Um, they did uh, a lot of, um, it, was, it was very interactive, like you mentioned, the first example you mentioned. So they did, uh, you know, Google Earth to explain where it had happened, how it had happened. They kind of built this story using different kind of media. And the idea, going back to Facebook, is that publishers, they want to try to wean themselves off Facebook, but it's like, if you don't exist on Facebook, you don't exist. It's a little bit like, you might remember the black, do you remember the black and blue dress story? Does anybody remember that? That it was like, why is this a story? And why is the New York Times also publishing this story? And it's because it went viral. And if New York Times didn't also publish a story on black and blue media, of course, uh, the black and blue dress, of course, their story was like, 
you know, scientific. But um, then it's like, where were you that day that you didn't cover the news of the day? <laughs> um, so it's a very interesting report. And there's the link if you later want to look a little further. Um, so this brings us to the fact that uh, Facebook has made a 300 million pledge to help journalists, just like Google did uh, last year. So this was in 2018. And they realized, you know, they're like, oh, wait, we made a little mess here. Um, so they realized that, of course, they want to try to, you know, there, there is a corporate, there's a social responsibility to um, make better journalism. But they also realized that this goes hand in hand. You know, if you want good content and you want to, if you have a platform, you want to have content you can show on your platform. So they have actually, for example, Google pledged $300 million to support journalism and fight fake news, and so did Facebook. Um, so that's that, and that's all for today. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry if I talk a little fast. Does anybody have any questions, comments, examples, just anything, really? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I didn't get a chance to print it, but I'm super happy to send it to you via email. So yes. Yes, I can send out, and if we have a, yes, definitely. How many of you are very, how many of you consume media on social media, or, you're, or is everybody here still very like prints, good, you know, really print oriented? Both. Yeah, both, okay. Digital, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a generational thing, obviously. Yes, please. Just wondering, what do you, what do you teach your Temple University uh, students? Do you teach them to get a newspaper, or do you teach them? No, of course. I mean, okay, so I don't, I think, uh, okay, so we have newspapers in our library, like physical newspapers. They don't, it's not a thing they, they do. They do just, like, they don't hold a newspaper <laughs> so i my my what i encourage them and what on my syllabus is like this semester you're going to follow bbc new york times you know nbc al jazeera you know i give them a list or even russia today so you see another perspective you know i give them a list of major publishers that i think they need to follow and i encourage them because because you know they're not willing to go out of their way so much so what i do is i encourage them which i'm also i'm, I'm also subscribed to a lot of these but i encourage them to do like like the you want more sign up here and write your email and then you get those little like digests you know new york times you know happy monday this is what you need to know that happens over the weekends it's super useful it's fast somebody's kind of like you know done and i mean i do i mean of course i want to get it from the new york times and hoping they're going to give me the headlines because i trust that they have an editorial policy that filters things but you know that's what i recommend to students because i feel like they're not going to go out of their way to consume to purposely look for news on some of these platforms so if they get it in their inbox it's like okay come on you just have to like open it and read it and um but I think newspaper, it's been, I, I've been teaching at Temple for 10 years and I, I, maybe like 10 years ago I talked about newspapers. Now I just don't even talk about newspapers. It's all digital. So I just say, please subscribe, you know, and, and be careful about who you follow and try to follow at least people that are like pro producing proper content that's verified. Um, so yeah, so we do, we do spend a lot of time on media literacy because it's a huge issue among this generation as well. But, um, but they get it. I mean, they understand the problems with it. It's just that also they're very niche. So the people they follow, I'll have a whole classroom and then maybe like, you know, only, it's in little groups, you know, some people, three people follow a guy, three people follow somebody else. So it's not like everybody's following the same thing. So that is also, it's very niche. It's very, they consume media in a very niche way. So yeah, yes. These are, so, okay, so these is, this is communication students which means it's a very broad major, but the class is called Journalism and Society. So it's not the only thing they do. So I'll have students that are studying communications that later want to work in PR, but they have to take a journalism class. So it's not like everybody in that classroom is aspiring to be a journalist. And actually very few are interested in being a journalist, to be honest. Yeah, it's not their thing, so yeah. Yeah, yes, please. <laughs> Thanks for today. I just wanted to ask about what you've noticed in the last few years about the quality of um, video packages and stuff that's spread online, like from editors. Is there an increase in um, demands for higher quality video? I'm just interested a bit about whether you've noticed that or whether there's still sort of value in sort of lo-fi style videos that, right. that are easily shared. I think um, it's a good question. Um, you know, the budgets really range. 
Um, and I'm not saying budget is everything, but if you have more time and more budgets, for example, NBC Left Field, they, they recently launched a digital channel as well, and they're willing to kind of sit on a story for like two months and publish it with, you know, a $10,000 budget, which other channels are like, you have one day to shoot everything and, um, and the, you know, you're on an $800 budget. So obviously the, con the content very much varies. But what I feel is also beyond that, um, even though we see different levels of quality, is that actually the viewers are, are not picky about what they see in terms of quality. I don't think people even care anymore. How, I mean, we, I look at it, I'm like, oh, what camera was that? That's really nice lighting. The viewer doesn't. The viewer's looking for like, oh, do I have a fuzzy feeling when I see this cute pet? And you know, it's, you know so it, it's about more how they feel and what the story's about than how it's actually shot. Um, and what I noticed also, and this is another little scary thing, is that the student, for example, a new generation can also be quite confused in terms of genre. So my students will ask like, oh, what's the difference between like reality and documentary? Of course, I'm, I have a heart attack. And they just think it's a very normal question. I have to go back and be like, no, okay, reality is produced. And they chose these people with these personalities because I want them to fight. And there's somebody like, you know, behind the scenes, like, you know, if you're on, what is the one? Survivor, you know, there's a whole, there's, there's a whole production behind this making things happen. It's very different from a documentary where you are actually doing things um, with the intention of finding a factual truth or to get as close to the truth as possible, whereas in reality, you're just entertaining, basically. And they don't really get the difference right away, the fact that these questions come up. Or I'll be like, okay, you have to go out and do a story on something in Tokyo. And I just kind of give them like free reign. And they will, some people will come back with an in interesting interview and some people will come back with a video of like food and Harajuku and the cute little ice cream, you know, edited like it was Facebook, like for YouTube. And it's, it's, and they, they, they think that it's, you know, it's not to criticize or anything, but they, for them, it's like good enough. They're like, well, well, you, we see stuff like that on YouTube. And I'm like, no, okay, there's YouTube and then there's television and television, there's still fortunately a filter which says you have to have things that are broadcast quality in a certain way um, with some exceptions of course if you have to shoot you know with a hidden camera or anything like this um, but they don't seem to be picky yeah they don't seem to be picky in terms of quality so I think there's me that's investing you know a big story a left field they have the digital strands that are investing in having better quality content even vice but vice is very smart they, they have so many verticals they differentiate they have like the bad stuff that they dump on youtube and then they have their hbo series in which they inject a lot of money so they know you know they have different strands and just yeah they have the specials and with better correspondence and better stories in which they take a really long time to publish and then just the stuff they put out daily on youtube so I, I feel everyone's trying to work in different ranges. They're trying to, they want to keep content going so they can't have the luxury of producing a documentary every two months. So they need to have the dailies and then they have like their specials. So maybe, is that to answer kind of your question? <laughs> yeah, budget, who you're trying to engage and so on, correct. Uh, but again, this is all very personal opinion, so yeah. You said earlier that yes. the, um, the BBC like and start as social media emerged, they started to repurpose the work for social media, but then Al Jazeera was one of the first producing just for social, primarily targeting social media. But what's the sort of decision making differences in producing for those two platforms? Right, so a lot of it is about style in, in a way. Um, so for example, let's say BBC did a really good documentary story and they decided to recut it in a way that's better for social media and, and bring it down to three minutes, five minutes. Um, uh, there's okay. There's a couple. There's a couple layer. A couple. It's it's kind of a multi prong. But first, they might hire different people. So they might actually hire a more professional cameraman for something that's been for their mainstream media, and then they will re-edit shorter and then publish it there as well. Whereas if they're producing original content, they will go with a different generation of journalists um, that might not be as experienced. And also they will, they will um, maybe BC is not the best uh, story for, the best example of what I'm about to say, but going back to Al Jazeera, the stories were very different. They, they were thinking about what's appealing to millennials because these are, these are the people that um, spend time on social media versus like what would be appealing for uh, Al Jazeera English, which has a very different audience. Same as BBC, they have a more like 40 to 65 audience. Um, 
So the content itself was different. The content itself is could can be different. They have different editors. So I'll just AJ Plus was based, for example, in um, AJ Plus based was based in San Francisco when they first started. It was all run by millennials. Whereas Al Jazeera Plus, you know, was based in Doha, and even though they had their Washington office, this was before Al Jazeera America was launched, and then they had to go off air. So it was it was just different editors, different process different way of um like maybe it's it's edited faster and more attractive for social media in a way whereas if you're watching a 30-minute documentary on bbc you can have like your nice beginning with the music and sit on a shot for a long time here it's like okay i want a different shot every three seconds so well what i'm trying to get at is that even if you had a case like that say, <laughs> you know full-blown bbc documentary you think okay I want to repurpose this for social media. So it's an editing process. They would potentially re-edit, yes. Yes. So I still don't see what's the problem with doing that. You just no, have it's an editing issue, right? Yeah, no, no, it's 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 perfectly acceptable, except that they would so so the, the, the creative process is quite different when you're thinking you're doing something longer and more in depth than when you have to get a ten second sound bite. So for example, for these really short stories, you're thinking the whole time, okay, I need to get this down to a minute because this would be a native one minute. If you're taking a BBC documentary that's half an hour, what it's actually gonna end up looking is like a trailer. So you know, you're cutting it down and then you're putting some text on it and it's more like a trailer. So you're not, in, you're not initiating the creative process knowing what the outcome is going to be. So the director of that documentary doesn't know that his content might be put out on Facebook in a shorter form. And he probably didn't shoot like that. He probably got like proper answers from people that, you know, people spend an, a minute explaining something as opposed to like, oh, do I have the five second? <laughs> this was this was the struggle with AJ Plus. Oh wait, can you, can I let me just ask this question again to see if they can like say it in ten seconds or else my soundbite doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that well it's the creative approach can be quite different, yeah. Yeah, as well. So yeah. Anyone else? Bring up yes. Any questions with your students? Like the, the recent Pelosi issue, Facebook won't take down the Pelosi doctored video. YouTube did. Do you get into those things with your students? For or? sure. Yes. 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 We definitely get into. Um, for example, even even these videos that. Um, for example, that have showed, um, we discussed this quite a bit, um, and you know, for example, I don't know if you remember the era also, like f ISIS started publishing their, those really highly produced videos, and you know, I would, I would spend hours trying to find them online, because I was like, I wanna watch this, I wanna see how they're producing, I wanna see if this is like edited properly, are there special effects here, like what are they doing? Because they're, 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 you know, they were so high and produced. Um, so we, you know, we do discuss a lot, uh, freedom of the press and what does that mean like how free am I really to publish on these platforms do these platforms need to babysit us or should it just all be up to us and we kind of the fact that you know Facebook and YouTube have the power to a lot of YouTubers are very happy about the fact that YouTube takes things offline for example not in case of Pelosi but just in general they get very happy about this but I feel that we've we've earned it in the sense that the more we blame the platforms for doing certain things the more they feel they have a responsibility to then like babysit the content so you know so when you have a whole government saying oh you know Facebook was responsible for the US you know what happened with the US elections then of course Facebook is gonna have to step up and be like oh we're gonna have to babysit this a little bit you know we're gonna have to have our editorial arm now saying what goes and what doesn't go I'm all for even though it's it's hard to say I'm all for let's just leave it there and have people watch it and make up their minds for example what happens with them um, with the killing in um, the in New Zealand so that that video was shared yeah. very quickly it went like wildfire I got it on whatsapp from like my aunt in Venezuela I was like this is insane I had looked for it all over online it was buried 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 it got to like very you had to go to these almost a deep web to find it you know so everybody talked about how we we had to take it offline um I have mixed feelings about this because watching it I, it's not like I like watching it but watching me definitely doesn't inspire me to do anything you know I I, I feel like people need to trust that you have a good mind and you have good skills to decide for yourself what you're going to do with that content, you know? So I had very mixed feelings with that particular video. Um, of course, I understand for respect the families and so on, you know, blurred and I totally get it. But there was a no show policy from all media on that video, for example. And, um, and, and, I, and after I went to these deep websites where they actually had the video, I, I understood why. 
I noticed a lot of the comments were a little bit like pro what had happened and it was a bit scary. I was like, oh wow, there's people out here that are like happy this happened, this is crazy. So um, yeah, and it was, I think it was illegal in some countries to even see it, right? There's countries now in which you cannot see this kind of content. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I'm not so sure how I feel about this. Mm. Should this be? I see it a little bit as a censorship issue, but I also want citizens to step up to the responsibility, you know? I mean, I understand people might say, oh, this is like a copycat thing, and I get that, and I get that when we report, for example, on suicides, you know, there's a protocol to follow. I totally understand the carefulness, but at the same time, you know, why can't we have access to this and just learn for ourselves or decide for ourselves um, as human beings, you know, what we should do with this content? I don't know, I don't. I don't think we need to be babysat. I really believe in media literacy, like strongly. I feel like people should be able to watch things and make up their mind about what they're watching. They, if they feel it's not true, don't share it or turn it off or fact check it and go look somewhere else, you know? So, I don't know, how do you feel about the Pelosi video? <laughs> I mean, do you guys see that as an infringement of freedom of the press? I think it should come down, because it's, it's a totally doctored. Well, in that case, because it's doctored, of course, with a, yes. With a clear political objective by a, sure. an organization that's got clear political objectives. Sure, sure. I mean, if it's up on a humor site listed as such, then okay. Sure. Sure. I agree. But what if somebody wanted to watch it to just see it? Like, you know, that's the thing, because then it becomes hard to find it. Let's say I just want to watch it because I want to see what they did with it. Or, you know, I have a right to watch it and see what they did with it. And then I'm like, oh, okay, it's doctored. You know, I get it. I don't necessarily think you do have a right, mm. frankly. I mean, it's, it's there. You find it, then you, sure. it. you can't, then welcome to planet Earth. Sure. Lots of things. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, agreed. I, a lot of times I feel also like to watch these things because they become, they're, you know, I'm analyzing them as well, you know, and I'm looking at them and how was it done? Who did this? How was it edited? How can I tell, you know? So it's a bit also from that standpoint, but so if I have the right, could another citizen, yeah. I don't know, it's a very tricky conversation, but I get it, especially if it's something that's not true. Mm. Sure, yes, and yes. They had a case in Australia recently where the uh, reporter sued his news organization for PTSD because they've been covering all of these horrific events, mm. murders and what have you. So if you're witnessing those events, this is, you know, a trained journalist. Sure. Not properly trained, not prepared for that kind of thing. It actually damages you. Of course. So if you just then, we now have platforms where you can just chuck out everything and you can just watch wherever you want. It can damage you. So sure. I think the whole evolution of journalism in having it editorial filters mm. is for that reason. Sure, sure. I mean, he could also choose. I guess you could also say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to cover conflict, or I'm, or I'm not going to watch this kind of stuff. I mean, you have. I think if you still think you have the power to choose, maybe no. I mean, you could decide. If there's a disclaimer, <laughs> maybe you decide you don't want to watch or you don't want to see or anything. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I don't know how many of you also saw the film, um, uh, what was it called, uh, uh, City of Ghosts, the Syrian film that was done on the citizen journalists. And so they showed a lot of the content. So these, these were kids that were covering, um, uh, it, it was, um, what's the name of the organization? So I'm forgetting right now. But anyway, they were covering um, ISIS and so on. And some of the content on there was brutal. And that content had never been shown on, um, on media, on, on, on CNN and BBC would have never shown that. Yet, because it was a documentary film, they showed a lot of the footage. It was horrifying to see. But these are people that like were witnessing this as it was happening. You know, they, I mean, they, I mean, I, you know, I, I could be damaged by watching it. They were incredibly damaged by watching it because they were seeing like this happen in their city. Um, so that um, this was in Raqqa. So that was pretty strong. So, but I felt when I saw it, I was like, oh, I understand so many more things now that I had not had the opportunity to see, so. But yeah, maybe it's a case-by-case -case basis, but yeah, I understand. Oh, did you want to say also something back there? Yeah. With the Christchurch uh, uh, sure. film. I mean, if, if it doesn't add anything to the content, I, I don't see the point of watching those videos. Sure. Then it's more like a sensational, um, and I don't really uh, believe in that type of video. Sure. But, yeah, yeah. personal. 
No, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's also about the intention, maybe, that you watch it with. Yeah, so it could be, you know, if, if you're published and you're like, oh, I'm gonna put this out there to get views, then it's like crazy. But if you're looking at it and you're, and you're you know, going, wow, okay, this is, you know, th- it, a lot of these things become case studies as well. For me, it's, I'm analyzing it the whole time. Now, how was this possible? How, did they, how was this able to be on Facebook for so long? How come nobody took it down? How come nobody flagged it? Where did, they, where did he first start putting this information saying he was gonna do this? How did that happen, you know? So, but I understand it's a bit, you know, taboo and, and we have to be careful about talking to it. I also don't think they should be readily available everywhere. And you know, I, I totally understand publishers, especially when you have the responsibility of being a mainstream publisher where you're accessing such huge audiences, you definitely have to edit. You definitely have to step up that responsibility. But in social media, it's like, it's a wild, wild west out there. Yeah, and in many ways, so, but sure. That creates many, many billionaires. Many what, sorry? It's also created many billionaires. Views. Views have, or? Billionaires. Billionaires? Like the, the platform owners, the Zuckerbergs, etc. Oh, right, the views have created, the, the consuming of content, have, yeah, the companies have created billionaires, of course, yeah. Yeah. But they're abrogating their responsibility for what's on the platform. Absolutely, but th- th- and this is sort of what, when you two first started, it was like that. It was like, we're just a platform, that's it. We're just a platform, you guys decide everything else. And then little by little, because they have been, you know, had a lot of ethics questioning, then they've had to step up, step up their game um, to, 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 but I, my students feel very strong. This is also, my students, for example, that generation definitely feels very strong about, um, they get very angry that like, oh, so-and-so got, his video got pulled down, like now YouTube is not free anymore, you know? <laughs> you know, they, they have, they, they think a lot about this, like where's the freedom on face on YouTube if you're gonna take things down? Um, so sure, yeah, of course our views generate somebody, they are generating money for somebody else, absolutely. Yeah, but th- that happens, I guess, with mainstream media a little bit as well. I mean, CNN, if we watch CNN. Well, of course, but that's the old model, right? Right. You know, where there is supposedly trained journalists to to make judgments on content. Sure. Of course, it's always a different take. It's, it's up to a human judgment. But Absolutely. It's like democracy. We haven't figured out a better way of doing it. Sure, sure. Because the algorithms certainly don't work. Sure. The thing is, the content on social media is not just journalism, it's everything. So it's so many genres we're talking about here and it's anything from my cute dog to it's all out there. And it's all on your same feed. When you're scrolling down your feed, you're like, what is this? I'm seeing this and this and this is important, this is not important, you know, and so on. So it's a very mixed um, genre world out there. <laughs> but yeah, yes, please. Uh, there was one other, there was a factor which I think that I've noticed, and I want to see if you, especially dealing with your millennial students and younger students, uh, have noticed the same thing, which is that uh, videos, news videos especially, which have high production values and which are very artistically created, seem to actually have a repellent effect in some ways, mm-hmm. because it, uh, it's, uh, it, the, for the younger generation, what they seem to value the most is a sense of authenticity. Sure, and we watching do, something you know, different, yeah. do a very nicely produced video like you or I might be inclined to do, at, you know, because we want to make it nice and professional and to impress our, our peers, it actually, in some ways, may reduce the audience in, in, in some cases. It could, I completely agree, but there's also, there's something about the viral video world, which is like, I don't know what they call it, like in, in English, like the expression water cooler talk. It's like when you come in the next day and you're in the cafeteria and you're like, hey, did you see this? And they're so short. Well, yeah, two minutes. Okay, I saw it, you know, and it almost gives people something to talk about. So indeed, they could be go, they could finish watching it and be like, oh, this is really not good. And, oh, we're finishing up. So they could really have a look and say, oh, this is really not good, but they still watch it. <laughs> By the time they realize it's like they've watched it. So, but I agree. Yeah, they're trying to find more authentic content, potentially, yes. So, yeah. Well, thank you for wrapping up. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for coming today. And um, I'm happy to, you know, uh, if you give me your email, I'm happy to send the information along. (laughs) Thank you. This is a one year's. Oh, you guys are Honorary membership.
Thank you. 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 Thank